as men to choose our own downward path. And ever since, we have been consumed in this. So let us look at two dimensions of this way of living. Now, in philosophy, there's something called hedonism. And it's an ethical theory. It is the belief that pleasure, pleasure in the sense of satisfaction of desires, is the highest good and proper aim of human life. There are many people whose life mission is to achieve the greatest satisfaction of pleasure for their lives. You ever heard people making a bucket list? I wanna climb Everest. I wanna do this, I wanna do that. I wanna earn this, I wanna build that. All of that is consumed and concentrated around this sense of the satisfaction of desire. And in Ecclesiastes chapter two, verses 10 and 11, Again, King Solomon, the author of this, makes the same observation. He said this, anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work as a reward for all my labors. But as I looked down at everything, I have worked so hard to accomplish. It was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. So what's happening here is that if we are consumed in this singular pursuit of pleasure for the physical sense of it, or even the emotional sense of it, it is all meaningless at the end of the day. You've heard of thrill seekers, people who want to cut new, I mean, across new frontiers, adventures in space. You know, this becomes the singular focus of the mind and dwells in the realm of hedonism. Because it becomes the price that man's soul is looking at. The only focus now is to achieve pleasure in any sense of it, you know, whether it be by acquiring material possessions, whether it is acquiring uh, financial uh, uh, accruing riches, or even in symbolic power, authority, and position in the society, when you're singularly focused on this, it is not the way to live beyond self. You are right in the thick of living for the flesh. Amen? Let us look at the second dimension of this, which is one of indifference. Hallelujah. You know, there are some people whose life are so calloused to pain. You know, anytime they hear of anybody's um, a misfortune, they say, tough luck. Life is tough. You know? And again, the preacher, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse one, observed this. He says, again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. Now we can't go about life saying every man for himself, and there's nothing I can do about it. If they are unfortunate, it is their lot. Uh, well, sure, there is something you can do about it. You can show compassion for the oppressed. That is the heart of the Lord. That is the heart of a believer is to show compassion for the downtrodden and to understand that except for the grace of God, there goes I. You know, so we can't live a life that is calloused to pain. You can't be so dismissive of, of people's adversity. You can't say tough luck, you know, suck it up. You can't say life is tough, you know, and walk away from it. Our expectation, if we're going to live beyond self, we cannot be indifferent to other people's pains. Amen? We cannot be indifferent to their discomfort. We owe them our compassion. We owe them our prayers. We owe them our support, moral and material. Hallelujah. Now let us dig further into this subject of living beyond self. Hallelujah. Now you've heard of the word coping. Uh, there are, you know, coping mechanisms for living beyond self. The three that I want to focus on this morning, there are many more. Coping mechanisms for living beyond self. One is to practice escape, you know? The other is to avoid denial. 
and the third is to shun withdraw. Amen? Now let's take each one of these uh, in depth. Hallelujah. Practice escape. You see, cautious avoidance of negative information and the myriads of distraction is good for our lives. If we are to live beyond self, we cannot have a sensory overload or be so pressured by the, uh, 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 the difficulties of life that we can't come up for air. Now, Ecclesiastes, again, the preacher in chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 says this, and it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it. What good is wealth if you have no good health to enjoy it? And to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. This is indeed a gift from God. And verse 20, let's pay attention here. It says, God keeps such people, the blessed people, God keeps them so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. Because every time you dwell on the negative, it bounces back and it grows bigger. And some people can't go forward for always looking in the rear view mirror, going over every mistake that they ever made, painstakingly reenacting the, diff the different options and spending their times living in the past. When you do that, you are wrapped up in yourself and you cannot live beyond self. Hallelujah. So to live beyond yourself, your ego, the egocentric, you know, focus, you must avoid and you must practice escape from constant, you know, uh, difficulties. You must look away and avoid cautiously negative information. Don't allow your body to be a receptacle for too much information about the things that are wrong in the world. If you want to uh, experience depression, take on the news. It's full of injustice and different things that are happening and the cohort of people that are glorifying this. If you focus and you don't practice escape and you go on to this 24 hour news cycle, you will not be able to live beyond yourself. Hallelujah. Let's look at the second uh, admonition here, which is denial. Now, this is almost the clear opposite of avoiding, you know, uh, or pra practicing escape. You know, what it says here is avoid propaganda and dogma. You know, like the four scribes described by Prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 11, says this, these false prophets, they offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wound, they give assurances of peace when there is no peace. You know, so what is it saying is avoid denial, avoid, uh, you know, uh, reducing or minimizing the obvious. Quit playing the ostrich. Don't say everything is fine and life happens. Don't do that. Recognize situations for what they are. And for this, Ecclesiastes, the preacher has a recommendation for us. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 13 and 4. King Solomon says, accept the way that God does things. For who can straighten what he has made crooked? Verse 14, enjoy prosperity while you can. But when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in life. You know, we are called to live by faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Now, some people uh, uh, activate faith in, uh, faith in reverse. Faith is calling those things that be not as though they were in anticipation of their physical manifestation. It doesn't work in reverse. Faith is not calling those things that are as though they weren't. You can't reduce reality by faith hoping it away. You can make declarations, you can make claims, but faith is 
the substance of things that are hoped for. If you're spending your time trying to dematerialize what is normal and what is real, you are not acting by faith. So avoiding uh, denial you know, and calling a spade a spade and accepting things the way God delivers to them, uh, delivers them to us, is how you start to live beyond yourself. Because then you don't take personal responsibility for tragedies when they happen, for difficulties when they happen. Everything comes from God. Every good and bad uh, situation is sanctioned by God customized to make your life a unique experience. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's look at the third coping mechanism here, and that's speaking of shunning withdrawal. Amen? Now, some people, in order to cope with the vicissitudes and the ups and downs of life, they basically uh, withdraw into their cocoon. And that's a word we have become very familiar with now, especially in the wake of this uh, pandemic, where all of us have been homebound for the most part. You know, so one way to kind of, uh, you know, shut out the world is say, leave me alone. I don't want to deal with anything in this world because nobody really knows what I'm dealing with. When you do that, what you have done is you've put the spyglass onto your own problems and you are now magnifying the uh, microscopic issues of your life. Hebrews 14 verses, uh, Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 and 11 tells us this. It says, seeing this, that we, seeing then that we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was tempted, in, was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And verse 16, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hallelujah. If you're going to live beyond self, you have to confront your problems head on. Grab the bulls by the horn. Come boldly to the throne of grace so that you can obtain mercy. It isn't going to help to shun the problem and to withdraw into a cocoon, you know, and to just uh, shut out the world and, and live in the closet of our minds, you know. So if we are to live beyond self, we have to practice these three coping mechanisms. We have to learn to practice escape from the inundation of, of evil and bad news and negative things. You know, we cannot be indifferent to life. You know, we have to avoid denial. And lastly, we have to shun withdrawal, which means we have to engage with everything in our lives. Amen. I want to close now with the word. Here is the final word. But this is an anonymous quote that has uh, had a tremendous import, impact on my personal life. It says, but for a tiny little exception, this whole world consists of others. Let's think about that. What is this tiny little exception? The tiny little exception is you and me. But for you and I, this world consists of others, other people. Even when you're a family, you still uh, have these tiny little exceptions within you. You're not all the same. You don't have the same organs. You don't have, you have similar, you know, uh, gene but you don't share the same organs unless you're co-joined, you know? So we must engage the ministry of suffering like Christ. We must hold on to our confessions. We must recognize our weaknesses because we're not Superman or women. We must recognize the chinks in our armors, our triggers, those things that set us off. You, we must live for Christ who died and rose for us. We must build a community. 
You know, we say this often, we must love others and we must care for the lost. Who are the lost? Those are the ones that have no idea of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are the ones that can reduce their uh, life explanation to biological factors. For these, above all, is the will of the Father. It is the will of the Father that we live beyond ourselves and that we don't focus just on our own problems and that we don't spend our eternal life, uh, entire life trying to fix our own problems. God intends for us to be a community of people, a community of believers that are interdependent, that are working together according to his purpose for our own good. When you care for the lost and they become saved, they join your community. And this ripple effect keeps going on and on and on. Remember that the largest uh, 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 body of faith in the world, Christianity, began with Christ and 12 men. The 12 apostles. And this over, you know, uh, 2,000 years ago. The ripple effect continues. Each one, rich one. That is how you live beyond yourself. Hallelujah. We thank God for his word today. You know, I never uh, missed the opportunity to uh, share salvation prayer. I know that we die to ourselves daily, and I know that many have come to the saving knowledge of the grace of God. But perchance there is someone who is watching me right now or who will watch this broadcast later who has not made this decision. Let me share with you. Romans chapter 10, verse nine in the Living Bible says this, for if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and believe in your own heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So please, right now, I want you to just close your eyes and say this prayer with me and mean it in your heart. Saints, join in. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I repeat that. I turn from my sins and I repent. I invite you to come into my heart and life this instant. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, if you just said that prayer for the first time, you have provoked such joy in heaven. Angels are rejoicing for your sake. Grace Gate Church is rejoicing for your sake. We thank God for what you have done, for this is the mission central. It is to share the salvation of God that is so full and free so that you too can live beyond yourself. Hallelujah. Three quick things as we close. If you just said that prayer, the enemy and the adversary of your soul is very wily and crafty. He's going to sneak around and tell you nothing's changed. See, it didn't make any difference. You don't feel any different. Don't let him lie to you. Three things I recommend that you must do now that you said that prayer. One, talk to God every day. Christians call that prayer. You say, how? Tell him how you feel. Tell him what you need. Tell him how, you know, uh, he, your day is going. You know, pick a time of day to do it. Do one long session. Do several long sessions. Keep him on abreast of how you're doing. And talk to him every day. Now, read the Bible every day. You say, why? Because God talks to you through his word. You know, as you begin to read his word and as you make a habit of it, he talks to you, he reveals uh, words to you, he reveals knowledge to you, he reveals things to you in his word, and he speaks words into your situation, words into your circumstance, and word into the lives of those that you are interceding for. Hallelujah. And finally, I recommend that you join a Bible-believing church. You have a home here, you're welcome, and you will grow and mature into the purpose of God's calling in your life. Oh, hallelujah. I thank God for this message and this Sunday, this 114th day of the year. 
We thank God that you've joined with us today, and I just want to bless you now. Father, I declare that they are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and everything they put their hands to this week shall prosper and be successful. Let us share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. 